agencies or, or organizations that serve the African community here in the province of Ontario. Um, the topic for today's uh, discussion, well, first of all, let me congratulate uh, Lady Kay and her uh, organization, Global uh, Women's Organization for the phenomenal job that they've been doing in bringing programs such as this to the Black you know, community. Uh, one of the challenges or the main challenges that we are facing as a Black community or even the African community is lack of resources to tackle the issues that we face. Uh, now in the news, they are talking about housing and the issue is housing is not just the issue, but we have serious mental illness in our community. And the coming in of the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 also has made the already bad situation worse. Um, we have met a lot of political leaders and policymakers in all the three levels of government to advocate for more resources for our black community, especially the African community. Uh, however, when it comes to us, as black community, something that needs to be done within a month or a week or so will take about a year or a couple of years to be done. So today, as you ladies, uh, or as all of you, you speak on this issue and come up with recommendations. Um, I hope we will also look at the issue of getting uh, uh, resources available, you know, to tackle this issue of mental illness and autism. I believe if we can get uh, the resources available, we will be able to help the families that are going through these things. Because when somebody is mentally unstable, it affects uh, his or her ability you know, to be properly employed. And when you are not employed, how can you get a good housing or even pay your rent or put good food on the table for yourself and your family. It affects all aspects of your life. Uh, so it's a serious issue. And I really congratulate Lady Kay and the organization for taking up this issue today. I wish you the best. And I want you to know that African Council is always behind you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, the chairman, for all you've been doing for the African community. So on this note, I'll be introducing to you the first speaker of the day, who happens to be the keynote speaker. I will be sharing my screen for you to see. Just one quick second, I'm trying to share my screen. Pardon me if I'm not so good at that. Okay, so can you see my screen, please? Not yet. You cannot see my screen yet? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me try again. Share screen. And share screen comes here. Now you can see? Yes. Thank you so very much. So, um, the keynote speaker for today, that is uh, Dr. Nazila Kanlu, RN PhD. She's a, she's a women's health researcher in mental health in the Faculty of Health at uh, York University and professor in the School of Nursing. She's the academic lead of the Lillian Mayer, if I don't pronounce well, pardon me, Right Maternity Child Health Scholars Program. Professor Kanlu's uh, clinical background is in psychiatric nursing. Our overall program of research is situated in the interdisciplinary field of community-based uh, mental health promotion in general, and uh, mental health promotion among youth and women in multicultural and immigrants receiving settings in particular. She applies intersectionality informed frameworks 
using diverse research methods in community-based research. She's founder of the International Network on Youth Integration, INYE, an international network for knowledge exchange and uh, collaboration on youth, and editor-in-chief of INYE Journal. She has published articles, books, and reports on immigrant youth and women and mental health. So I welcome you. You have the floor for the next 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm just going to put my share screen on. Can everyone see that? Yes. Great, thank you so much. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for inviting me to part of uh, this important uh, event. And I know a lot of work goes into organizing such events. Uh, we do them at my office too. So thank you so very much, uh, Ms. Candy Amazon, and uh, a, a, a particular thank you to Mr. Michael uh, and everyone who's here today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, social support for racialized families of children um, and youth with developmental disabilities. And so um, I'll provide a bit of a background information, and then I'll share with you a project we did a number of years ago on racialized mothers. Um, these were um, uh, Black mothers, mostly from the Caribbean and uh, one from Ghana. It's a small project that really led us to thinking through uh, some of the issues and now engaging in a larger project. And I'll talk briefly about that at the end. And also just to share with you uh, some of the publications from our office. So just to uh, define, I'll be talking in general about developmental disabilities. Uh, these refer to different types of disorders and you may have heard some of these uh, terminologies before. So they are, they cover a broad field of disorders such as Down syndrome, fragile X, uh, intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorders, cerebral palsy, and others. Uh, their aspect is that they are lifelong. So the individual who has them uh, has, uh, has, the, uh, has this for life, uh, for their lives, and it's persistent, uh, and it can affect various areas uh, of one's functioning. It can affect psychosocial, sometimes physical functioning, and often participation in daily activities, so such as in the community, such as in the school, such as in the workplace. So this is a very, uh, just a brief overview of what we mean when we talk about developmental disabilities. Now, uh, at, at my office, uh, we focus on uh, parents, one area that we focus on. And we find that when parents are raising children or looking after young adults uh, with developmental disabilities, it's not just that they're parenting, it's not that, that they're engaged in the usual responsibilities of being a parent, but because of the child's needs, they can provide significant amount of caregiving that the child needs, which is, uh, which is an additional stressor. And on top of that, because often services are limited or they're not accessible, as parents, they have to engage in quite a bit of advocacy in getting the support and the uh, help that their children need. So you can, you can imagine, uh, you know, being a parent is an important responsibility, but when there's a child, and sometimes there's more than one child with a disability, the parents are also um, kind of uh, straddling caregiving and advocacy responsibilities. So. Um, why focus on immigrant and uh, racialized mothers? Uh, if you start at the bottom of this slide, let's look at the bottom where it says mothers of children with developmental disabilities. We know that these moms compared to others, uh, moms increase uh, uh, face in their day-to-day -day life, more stressors. It may be because of the behavior of the child. It may be because they're not getting the help they need. It may be impact on the family in general. And sometimes these mothers have to work part-time or give up their work entirely to be able to care for the child 
with the special needs. So then they become uh, specifically socioeconomically disadvantaged. Then just moving up from the bottom to immigrant mothers of children with developmental disabilities, we know that um, when people immigrate to a new country, this, this affects their social determinants of uh, health. There is the uh, stressor uh, that the family faces because of immigration, because of resettlement. And we know that new immigrants in particular face specific health inequities, and some immigrant groups face this on a long-term basis. Now, on top of that, you add being a racialized mother, uh, a mother who's not mainstream, a mother who's not white. Uh, we know that racialized families um, also uh, face disadvantages, inequities in their social determinants of health. Then you add that on top of being a, um, a mother uh, in a family with a child or a youth with a special needs. And so all these, and on top of that, if you're a racialized mother, if you're a black mother, there is racism, there's discrimination. So when all these factors come together, and when we talk about intersections, gender, being a mother, caregiving of a child, youth with disability, uh, being an immigrant or being a racialized mother, there are unique and added stressors that the moms face. Now, uh, these are just two slides on one slide from our earlier studies. Uh, so the one on, I guess it's my left, with the child and, and the mom's black. That was our first study where we, um, uh, you know, my background's mental health. And uh, for the most part, I focused on women's mental health to that point. But I noticed that in the literature and in the research around disabilities, uh, and especially developmental disabilities, there isn't a lot of focus on immigrant groups. And because I had done research up to that point, uh, quite a bit of research on immigrant families, I found, I found this missing because we know immigrant families also have children with special needs. So uh, that was, uh, that's a cover of our report from our earlier study. And as we did that study and spoke to, uh, to mothers, we realized how little these moms have to take care of their own health and well-being when they're always looking after uh, others. And so the other uh, picture is, the, uh, this is from a later study where we looked at mothers' health promotion, and again, mostly focusing on immigrant mothers. This led us to seeing that there was very little focus on Black mothers. So we then did a trial. We were funded, uh, and I'm grateful for the funder. It was with College Hospital. Um, and we got a small, this was a small project. We got a small amount of money to interview uh, Black mothers, as well as service providers who provide service to a uh, uh, Black population. And this was an interdisciplinary team. Uh, you know, my background's nursing, but we also had sociology, social work, psychology, uh, as well as um, uh, my good colleague who's here, Dr. Atia Khan, uh, who is a postdoc fellow and uh, is a physician with a PhD. Uh, she did all the interviews um, for this project. So thank you so much, Dr. Khan, for joining. Um, now, uh, as I said, it was a small community-based studies. We did in-depth interviews. And um, in all honesty, it took a while to get even seven mothers to participate in our interviews. Um, we spent quite a bit of time trying to sensitively recruit into the project. And uh, so it, uh, it really took a while, but the mothers who participated uh, provide a lot of important information, which I'll be sharing with you in the slides to come through their own voices. Um, so we were in general wanting to know what is an inclusive approach to health promotion for racialized mothers of children and youth with disabilities. And uh, as I said, uh, of the uh, seven moms who were part of the project, uh, six were from Caribbean background and one was from Africa. This was a very educated group. Uh, they had, uh, you know, a grad, uh, undergraduate, graduate level education. Sadly, um, more than half were unemployed, which is not uh, unusual when you think about migration status or even uh, racialized status and caregiving for um, uh, children uh, with disabilities. And most uh, were not uh, 
were had a single status. So imagine uh, just all the responsibility of being a single parent and looking after their child or sometimes children with developmental disabilities. So um, in the next um, uh, slide, I'll be talking about first challenges, but I'll also be talking about some of the strengths of the mothers. And this was the quality to study. And in quality to study, we don't present numbers often. We present what the participants directly said through what we think major issues are they're telling us, but also importantly, sharing their voices with you. So this is um, one of the mothers in terms of stressors, uh, multiple stresses she was facing saying, I'm really stressed out all the time. It's affected me. I did stop working, but I did, don't feel good about it. I'm very worried about everything. I'm struggling financially. I'm going to go to court next week with the tenant board. I'm just overwhelmed, but even when I work, I feel it's impossible to. It's impossible with three kids. So mom experiencing many stressors, including issues related to housing. Um, this is another uh, quote from another mother in the project uh, in terms of raising children with developmental disabilities. I know that I have to sacrifice a lot for them because they can't speak for themselves. My son can't articulate how he's feeling because of his learning disability and stuff like that. So I know that I have to be there to help him. As for my daughter, uh, who had a developmental disability, I make sure she has everything she needs, that she doesn't have too much to depend on or have other people uh, treat her differently because she's a certain way. I make sure she's aware there are people that really care about her. So I don't leave her with just anybody. But overall, you know, she was talking about uh, her patience and understanding. Another quote in terms of mothering children with disabilities, being a Black mother or racialized mother. Uh, in this quote, we see experiences of racism and discrimination uh, and lack of access to support. So the mom says, uh, well, I was just annoyed. Like, I don't think the doctor had anything to do with it. I just thought the guy that was serving me, he probably was just a little bit racist. I think he uh, just wasn't serving me and he probably didn't check me in and probably just had me waiting there because he probably didn't want me to get health service. I don't know what his past experience or whatever, but maybe he didn't want me to get treatment. So again, just the barrier and the discrimination that the mom faced uh, is captured in this quote. Now, uh, we also need to look at the larger community and. Um, most of the interviewed mothers reported having completed post-secondary education, as I said earlier, college degrees, university degrees, master's degrees, but they were single. And uh, some had more than one child with a developmental disability. And they didn't feel like they had support of close or extended uh, uh, family or friends. So this mom says, my support, I don't know right now. I know there's community support, but personally I'm withdrawn. My family is not supportive. Uh, they don't know how to be, I guess. Right now, I'm not really doing much and I'm stressed out about finances. Um, so when we try and capture uh, all of these issues from, uh, for the mothers, we uh, see, first of all, in the uh, bottom part of this arrow, uh, you know, in general, society expects a lot from, um, you know, mothers, whether they have children with disabilities or uh, typical children. And mothers have to be uh, regarded, uh, a good mother is regarded as a perfect mother. And the gaze is people are always looking at her. So family members are looking at her, communities looking at her, institutions are looking at, at her. Now, when we um, look at mothers with uh, children with disabilities, and these are moms who are engaged every day uh, uh, and uh, 24 hours a day in caring for their children with disabilities. And they need to bring in extra uh, help sometimes if they have it. But they also have uh, to face personally the stigma associated with the experience of mothering children with developmental disability. And uh, sometimes even bl being blamed uh, by um, family members, community, uh, but uh, she is the one to be blamed for. And then uh, on top of that, 
if we add, uh, you know, in a multiracial in a post-migration context, issues of racism and discrimination, um, this can affect uh, the availability as well as access to and inclusion in the services that they need for their children and they may need for themselves. So as you can see, the issues compound when we are talking about moms who have children with disabilities and moms who are racialized. Now, I wanna just spend a couple of slides on strengths too, because these moms, despite the challenges, uh, have tremendous strengths. Um, so uh, this uh, mothers noted the importance of teaching their children about racism, raising awareness and making them conscious about the reality of racism in society and uh, saying that they have to work twice as hard as non-racialized individuals. So this quote is from a mom. Uh, I just find that my experience, I like to let my kids know what really ha uh, is happening, make them be aware that racism is real and they shouldn't allow certain things to happen because I believe I wasn't really warned. And my parents did experience a lot of racism and they didn't tell me until like I was a lot older. Like my mom got strip searched by the police. They accused her, said she was a man and strip searched her and violated her rights. She never told me these things until I was much older. So I like to let my kids know, give them examples of little things so they know what's racist and what's not and what's acceptable. Um, this is a quote that um, uh, talks about um, mothers practicing and teaching key values to their children, such as tolerance, respect, and understanding. So she talks about exercising, good thoughts, good thinking habits, kindness, having love for people, regardless of how they feel about you. So really taking a holistic approach towards society, but also to our own mental health and well-being. Now, we also asked moms about recommendations for practice and policy, uh, and they did talk about training needed for service providers um, and the need for increased awareness. So um, uh, mom said service providers need to know that racism is embedded within social structure within Canada and that racism limits people's access to certain services and once they're aware of this, uh, they would be able to know how to advocate on behalf of racialized people. In terms of inclusion and participation in decision-making, uh, mothers wanted to be included in policies and programs uh, to uh, and the decision-making around them and to participate in the design of such programs. So to make them more family-centered. Uh, one mom said, by speaking with these people and finding out what their needs are, find the people with those issues because they would know better, right? Formulating the plan and educating whoever's actually experienced in those situations and training them how to help other people with those situations. Uh, you know, despite all of the uh, challenges and stressors, these moms were also helping other moms in similar situation. And, uh, sharing knowledge and information. Uh, other recommendations also from the moms were to include service providers with diverse backgrounds in service delivery, providing more information about services, providing more programs and services, as well as a specific hotline to support moms who have children with disabilities. So in conclusion, uh, just to reinforce that all these factors coming together create um, limited time for moms to look after their own health. So this was a project about how moms look after their own health. But in the end, with all of these factors, you can see why they might have very limited time to look after their own health and well-being, being a mother, being a racialized mother, and specific challenges that are associated with uh, raising uh, on a, a child or sometimes more than a child with disabilities. So after this, a, a, a few years after this project, COVID happened and it impacted everyone. And um, among the groups that were uh, inequitably affected were racialized um, families, were racialized groups uh, and uh, groups with special needs. 
So we now are engaging in a large study. And these are the recruitment flyers for the large, large study looking at um, uh, post-COVID of uh, you know, your young persons who, who may be 16 to 29 years old with developmental disability and who self-identify as Black, East Asian, or South Asian. And um, we'd like to hear from them around social support during and beyond the pandemic. Or if sometimes the young person is not able to participate, is not able to speak for themselves, a family member participates with them. Often it's mothers, but in the past, we've also had fathers who have uh, spoken on behalf of the uh, child. We're also interested in service providers and uh, community folks, uh, community agencies who serve racialized families in terms of uh, letting us know um, uh, they're experiencing providing social support for these particular racialized groups. So those are the groups that we're interested in. We produce a lot of these, uh, these are just, and they're on the website. I'm gonna provide our website just momentarily. These are uh, available open access, which means you can download them. And they are short three pages, four pages information on our research project. So they're for a quick read, for us to share with the community quickly uh, in a brief form what our studies are about and some of the uh, findings as well as uh, suggestions by participants. So those are examples from a couple and here's uh, some more. And as I said, I'll just provide you with our website uh, if you're interested to look at them at some other time. We've published a lot uh, in, in journal articles around developmental disabilities uh, through our office. And this is just a list of them. I won't go through them, um, but um, again, most of our uh, activities are on the website. And finally, this is the website for our office. Uh, that's a Twitter handle, and that's our office's um, email. And uh, Lady Kay, I'm done. So may I stop sharing my screen? And thank you so much again for your time and opportunity to participate today. Thank you. Thank you. You can stop sharing your screen for now. Thank you so much for this in-depth uh, presentation. We appreciate the time and the thought and energy you have put into this. I will call on the next speaker. I'm going to reserve all the questions until later and comments. Okay. Thank you so much. So, Mrs. Akonde, are you there? Can you hear me? You're on mute, Dr. Akonde, from Nigeria. Yes, I'm here. I can hear you loud and clear. Wonderful. Okay, you have the floor for the next 10 minutes. Thank you. All right. Good evening here, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Akonde. I am the um, I would say public servant for Patrick Speech and Languages Center and Pure Souls Learning Foundation. Okay, so, one second, one second. We are having a technical glitch. Many people are sending messages they are not able to join. So that we are trying something at the back end. If for any reason it affects this, please log in back immediately, okay? Thank you. Okay. I'm telling everybody, if it affects us, Please log back immediately if we are logged out. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. So um, I've been doing this now for 18 years. I'm a mother of a young man living with autism and thriving with autism. I will share more about myself as I go on with the slides. Um, the center caters only and purely for individuals living with autism, ranging from age um, three to infinity. We don't discriminate on ages when we get to a particular stage. We keep, we keep going. Anybody that comes to our doorstep and we can help, we go ahead to help. So I'll be sharing my screen now. Um, okay. So I'll start. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can see. You can make it bigger. 
I can make it bigger. Okay, let's see. If we can. I think you go to the focus. Yeah. Make it bigger, please. Make it bigger still. No, it's okay. better. We are good. It's better. It's better. Okay. Listen I guess everybody can expand their screen. Yeah, if you can expand your screen if you're using your phone or otherwise. Okay. All right. So uh, first I would like to say a big thank you to Global Women Ambassadors for inviting me to speak um, on a topic that's when you wake me up, even in the middle of the night, I will jump up and then talk about it. Um, um, it's, a, it's very dear to me because um, of course I've walked that road, I've lived in the area of needs and we've taken very, very many long nights getting things available in Nigeria. As I mean, I was, I was uh, smiling when the president of the Af African um, society in Canada was talking about how services is scarce. I smiled because I know that if they are saying services is scarce, because we know we don't have any services available in Nigeria. So I put my slide into like a tree so that we can see in a nutshell how the families, um, so sorry, bear with me a little bit, um, struggle and how we have been able to support in the Nigerian society. So first of all, um, Minutes, please. To move this somehow away. Okay. So today I'll be talking on the lifelong struggles of parents and families with um, children living with autism, and I've divided it into two parts. For us, we have the financial strain and the emotional toll. And in most of the developed world, the financial strain is not really very, it's not very strong because um, I would not say it's not there, it's there, but it's not as, as, um, as um, terrible as we find it in this part of the world because it's the parents that take care of the children. The government has absolutely nothing for children with special needs. They can hardly manage typical children and then by the time you now add children with special needs, hmm, that is really something that they, they struggle with on a regular basis. So we set up the center in two ways. The center runs on a fee paying um, program, but we also have a non fee paying program. So that is why when you see Patrick Speech and Languages Center, you see Pure Souls Learning Foundation. And um, that way it tells you um, a little bit about the fact that we support families through, um, through what we call um, scholarships. So we are looking for scholarships to support the families that struggle daily. So what exactly are we saying when we talk about autism? For those, you know, I know many people here really do know about autism, but for those that don't know about autism, what is it exactly? I call it a different brain because I believe that every child that is um, diagnosed with autism has something to give, has something to share, has knowledge to impact the community. So for um, autism, we'll look at four major areas. I mean, the DSM-5 has now looked at um, sensory dysfunction, which was not looked at in the, in the, in the, in the past. So autism, like we say, is a developmental disorder that affects children. It comes from childhood. You don't get autism in adulthood. It starts from your childhood and, and then faces out through life. So it's food, um, development. Um, Mrs. Adekolu, please, can you mute yourself? Mrs. Ola, please, can you mute yourself? Hello, Mrs. Adekolu. Okay. Mrs. Adekolu. Sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm... All right. So, um, so it affects in the area of behavior, communication, social skills, and then sensory dysfunction. So when we say behavior, the child has an odd behavior. When we say communication, the child is not communicating with either parents. The child might be verbal or non-verbal 
and is not communicating effectively his needs, and then we talk of social skills, tend to play alone, does not interact with families, does not understand social communication, facial expressions. Those are um, social cues that the child needs to function in, 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 in life. And then sensory dysfunction is either undersensitive or oversensitive to um, sound, taste, touch, smell, and sometimes taste. So we, we, th those are the four main areas where the child struggles with. And when we say the child has autism, what are the main areas? In Nigeria, the first thing you see, my child is not speaking. And that starts uh, an emotional rigmarole. So, and the parents now start to spend. The first area is, where do, how can I get screening? And to get screening, you need to go to the hospital, you need your finances to be intact for you to see the doctors, to be able to tell them what the challenges are. There are no social amenities that gives you access to diagnosis. If you do not have the money to look for diagnosis, you are in a fix. So, and then we look at, um, like I said, the financial strain and the emotional toll. Um, so in the financial strain, when you get a diagnosis, what happens next? Educational challenges and then the social isolation, which is one of the biggest areas um, in Nigeria. In the emotional toll, you have the parental mental health, parental mental health, um, and then the siblings and family, family dynamics. So I'll go down to the third um, third um, line where we'll talk in depth about this. So for the financial strain, you're looking at early diagnosis, early intervention. At the center, we have we are beginning to see a little bit more adults coming into the center than children. Why is that? The children are beginning to be diagnosed early enough, but because of the social isolation, which has to do with stigma, the parents are not willing to put their children in the right places at the early stage. So they would manage them in mainstream school because they want them to have what we call the educational or academic background. So all this, uh, as we go along, is interwoven. They are looking at how can I get my child in the mainstream school and still find a little bit of help in that mainstream school. So what happens typically is that most of the mainstream school charge higher. That's when you get the high cost of therapy. They charge the children, uh, the families that have children with, with autism or developmental dis uh, dif difficulties higher than the typical children. So the parents have to cough out more to be able to support their children in the mainstream school. Now, are the mainstream school equipped enough to have to be able to manage these children? The answer is some are, but most of them do not have the skills. That is where training comes in. That is where awareness comes in, in terms of creating awareness. And that falls back on us with the service providers to continue to talk about this on a daily, if possible, on a daily basis. If you go to our um, Instagram page, we are constantly talking about getting help for these individuals early. But we are seeing more late intervention because the parents have kept the children in the mainstream school with minimal support. And then they are in a particular class. At the age of 10, the child is still in year, uh, is still in year two. So they nowhere else to go. And, the, uh, and when the school gets a bit agitated, they begin to tell the parents, sorry, we can no longer help your child. You now have to start looking for mainstream, for a special school, where it is almost too late to support these individuals. I'm a, I'm a proponent of morning is any time you wake up. But when you get them at the later stage, it is more difficult to give them the adequate support that will help them to live a full and functional life. So when you look at the early diagnosis and challenges that come in early, even some children go without diagnosis. They just um, go online and see, oh, this my child is not doing this, this, this. They just assume it's autism. And you know autism mimics, um, a lot of developmental challenges mimics autism. It could be ADHD. It could be delayed speech. It could be something a little bit more, di di more different. But because they do not have the resources to go the, the whole hog to find out what the challenges are, 
they begin to just you know guess and work on a daily basis. And then in, in, so, in this area of social isolation, you find that many of the families um, do not want to socialize either with other family members or in the community because they will say, oh, what will people say? How will anybody see my child that is not speaking? They will be wondering what is going on. They will be, um, find, they will be trying to find out if there's something wrong with me. And the, the extended family does not help as well because we begin to see, oh, it's not in our side of the family. Oh, where did you, where did the mother come from? Or where did this, where did you bring this child from? It's not, we've never seen this kind of thing in our families before. And I'm sure if they, most of them, if you go deep and ask questions, you will find out that there's somebody in the, in the past that had one thing or the other to do with autism, which they have neglected over time. So stigma is another area of, of um, challenge where the families tend to completely, some even completely, totally, just keep the child in the home environment and say, oh, this child is not going to amount to anything. And then I keep the child in the home environment. And then of course, when you see the um, um, social stigma coming in and then the marriage starts to break down, the husband starts to um, withdraw or and put all the blame on the wife. And sometimes very rarely we see the wife Put the blame on the husband, abandon the family and walk away, or the husband abandoning the family and walking away from the family. So we see this very often. It's very often and it affects the mental health of the families. Recently, we lost one of our parents who really, really struggled with her son. She just suddenly, you know, fell down and she died. I mean, I, I'm, I, I can tell it's due to exhaustion and, and all the burden she had to carry. She was a single mother, you know, taking care of this young man young, talented, young uh, uh, man who um, was just beginning to open up, but it was beginning to emerge, to come out of his shell, to, you know, show the kind, the strength and the talent he had. It was such a very a, a painful um, loss to us. We, we, from then on, we continue to encourage the parents to please take good care of themselves. I mean, look for um, family members or or communities or, or people around them that they can lean on when they are going through some of these challenges. And then finding the suitable um, educational environment is another area that we, we, we have um, seen as a challenge. There are not many places like us in Nigeria. Actually, when my son was diagnosed, um, when he was two, my son is now 25, we did not find any, any, anybody that had anything that could support his need at that time. So we managed in mainstream school. I had to be involved in that mainstream school. I went in there, I spoke to the teacher. I was constantly monitoring what they were doing in classroom. And then I got a, a, um, a speech and language therapist privately into the home to manage my son. And when he got to the age of five and I started to see how he began to emerge, you know, slowly, very slowly. The word started coming slowly, and then he started to draw. And then at a point, he had a love for figures that was out of this world. Anytime we were going out, he would take a pen and a paper, and he would be calculating everything and drawing. You know, I, I found it so amazing. So when he finished um, his um, year six, and I saw how well he emerged in things that were. Um, constant things that don't change. Uh, he struggled through English comprehension, social studies, history, all those things that needed summary that he needed to really struggle through it. And still, he did very well in mathematics. And funnily enough, in languages. And um, when he grew up, was when he was telling me that languages happen in patterns. There's a pattern to language. I, I found that intriguing. I then decided that it can't be just my son in the whole of Nigeria that has this challenge. I'm going to set up something to support families. And that was how we gave birth to Patrick Speech and Languages Center. And uh, today, 18 years later, the work that we have done with families is um, phenomenal, if I must say so myself. It's been a wonderful journey. The children and the adults have done, you know, have given insights, great insight into the minds of individuals living with autism. So much has been done and we are doing it more or less outside of the government and 
with family and friends, and maybe sometimes we, we, we send out letters for grants, which is very difficult, <laughs> especially knowing that we, we reside in Nigeria where people don't believe that when they give you money, you can do anything um, else with it, but put it in your pocket. And we've been able to support over, over 500 families that struggle financially. Even those that have not been able to come to our center, we opened up a WhatsApp group, put all the families in that WhatsApp group. We go there on a daily basis to give them tools that they can use in the home environment to support their children. Because we believe that it starts from the family. If the family can go on to accept and start the intervention on their own, then it will grow and the children will, be, will come out you know, in, uh, with, with very good skills. And then we look at the impact on the siblings and the family dynamics. Many times the siblings are left out of the support for their um, brother or sister, or the siblings themselves are overwhelmed because a lot of the um, support is, uh, a lot of responsibility is placed on their shoulders to care for their brother and support their brother in varied areas. Many of them revolt. I mean, there was a case of one young lady who refused to speak to her mother for years because she believed that the, all the attention was given to her brother and none was given to her at every point in time. We had to put um, that young lady in kind of mini therapy, you know, constantly talking to her and getting her to know the challenges that her brother was facing and how her input, her support, will help him over time. And eventually, you know, she came around and um, it became a, a, um, a, a strength for her as well. Anywhere she, anywhere she went and she would talk about her brother, doors were opening for her as well. So the impact on siblings, we have to be intentional about looking for how to support the siblings um, in, the, in their own mental health needs as well. And very, very, very important that we take that into cognizance. Um, so I don't have too much time. I don't know how much time I have left. I try to put everything in, um, in on this tree so we can look at it at, the, at, every, at, the, at this um, just in one view. My, my story will not be complete if I do not talk about a young man named um, Ziza um, who during the COVID period, we started what we call um, a live session on Instagram with families. And on speaking with this young mother, she wanted him in school. She said he wouldn't do anything in classroom. He's struggling, but there is this um, habit he has. He will take a, um, a pencil and he will take colors and he will start painting and drawing and then we just could, cannot stop him. That is the only time he stays calm. That is the only time he's attentive. Only when he has the paint and the brush and the pencil, that's the best time of his life. He just goes into you know, that mode and he draws the whole day. I have lots and lots of, of his drawing. I just packed everything and threw it under the bed. And I said, don't you think that that is a strength that we can look at and we can support? And we started, as I promised her that the next April, we will do a, uh, an exhibition of Ziza's artwork. And when we came up with that artwork, um, it's, I just, I was amazed at how expressive the young boy's artwork was. He's 13 years old. He drew the head of, um, the boy goes through, I mean, he has seizures. He drew a face with an exploding brain. What is that telling you? What exactly he feels each time he has his seizures? Mind blowing. We sold over, over a million of his, of his artwork in the first um, um, exhibition. And that exhibition is in the third year. We did the third one this April. And by the time we got to this third exhibition, we had from just Ziza, to the next one, adding um, Ziza, Christine, and Daniel to seven others. So this last one, we had seven individuals living with autism display their, um, um, their strength in the area of art. 
and their display had a story to each and every one of it. Some of them who could express themselves told us what it was about, what they were thinking when they were drawing, putting the artwork together. So what am I just trying to say at this point? Parents should take one day at a time. The first area that we need to look at is we parents need to start talking about it. I remember when I came out with my son, um, somebody walked up to me and said, Mrs. Akone, don't you think you are washing your dirty linen in public? I said, this is my son. And if I don't talk about him, how would I help others? So by promoting awareness, acceptance proves to be the best tool to exposing our community to individuals with autism. They have a brain that is different and we must accept and encourage that brain. They need the need for greater understanding, acceptance and inclusion coming from the focal point of strength rather than deficit helps the individuals with autism overcome societal barriers to create inclusive communities and workplaces. My son today is doing his PhD in mathematics. So you can imagine what we are talking about. It's amazing what these children can come up with if we include them and encourage them coming from a place of strength. Thank you for the opportunity for having me. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. Thank you for what you do. Uh, I will also put you in the cooler for now while we listen to the, you, you are joining us from Nigeria, right? From yes. St. Patrick. Thank you for all you do. Uh, Honorable Shade Etty from London, England, it's your turn. Please thank you very a... much. Thank you. Yes, I thank you. I'd like to say a big thank you to the organizers, that's the Global Women Ambassadors, um, Kemi Amusha and Hatsin for organizing this, because definitely there's a lot of work that's been done behind the scenes. And I sincerely like to credit my former speakers. We have um, Dr. Nazalia Kanlu and also Dr. Akode. And it seems I'm the only one that does not have a doctor in front of her name. <laughs> but I that's know okay. the doctors. The story is so important. <laughs> I am not a missus. I don't know. Everybody calls okay. me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my, I mean, I am Councillor Shadi Ese. And I'm the Deputy Cabinet Member for Homelessness and Housing Needs for London Borough of Hackney. And within my portfolio, um, I contribute to the strategic agenda and work program to ensure the delivery of um, our manifesto commitment. And I'm thinking, some will be thinking, oh, how does homelessness and housing needs come into being? Um, personally, from my own perspective, I have worked in various settings in terms of working in community with regards to mental health um, service user. I have worked in supported accommodation for mental health specific. And within my portfolio, we have one in four coming through our doors with multi-complex needs, including mental health. And with these slides that I'll be presenting today, I must acknowledge a teamwork. It's not only me, I must acknowledge Claire Girard, Jennifer Winter, Sarah Desi, Amy Wilkinson, Caroline Sharp, and Arthur. They do credible work behind the scenes. And let me say something from the UK perspective, because I, when I was about to, I asked, um, and um, Kemi Amushan with regards to this when she said mental health and um, the act with regards to Canada. In UK here, autism isn't a mental health problem, but if, if anyone that is autistic may likely experience a mental health problem because there are, there are other experiences with regards to other conditions thoughts, such as attention, ADHD, which is an attention deficit hyperactive disorder. And from my borough, let me just say a little bit about Hackney, um, or way be between the homelessness. In, in, within the homelessness, in 2014, 80% of homeless people in England had mental health issues. 45 were diagnosed with mental health condition. 
So when we are talking about mental health, and I know this is especially about autism, but at the same time, I think it just coll collaborates with each other. Um, and, I'll, and I'll definitely talk on that as I go forth. Okay, can and I can you, share your screen? Can you share my, yes, please, thank you. This is your screen, right? Can you see it? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yeah. And it says, what is autism? Autism is a um, spectrum disorder. It's a condition, it's a developmental condition caused by differences in the brain. They have autis autistic people have differences with social communication and interaction style, and they have specialized focus and intense interest. And I think we've been able to see that from evidence from Mrs. Zakonde and also from the research that has been carried out by Dr. Nazila. They have a different thinking style to non-autistic people. And these differences can mean some autistic people have a specific support needs when living and navigating a neurotypical world. They may also have different ways of learning, moving or paying attention. And some might also have some of these differences. It is a spectrum condition and it affects people in different ways. Like all of us, autistic people have their own strengths and weaknesses. The pathway to support, I will be talking from London Borough of Hackney perspective, and also with regards from evidence that was carried out by the NHS in conjunction with Let's Talk with regards to three boroughs, which is the London Borough of Hackney, London Borough of Newham, and the City of London. Done. And that research was specifically with regards to BAME, which is Black and ethnic minority. But with regards to Hackney, these are the pathways to support. We support young people who should get support for their needs, including learning needs, mental health, communication, and others, without the need of having a diagnosis. Diagnosis can be a very important part of a young person's journey and their family to gaining a better understanding of their needs and their identity. However, it should never be the determining factor to getting the help they need. Currently, all assessment clinics at a national level are experiencing long waiting times. In City and Hackney, for assessment to be carried out, the wait is currently between 12 and 18 months. And the supports that are available without a diagnosis include the speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, mental health support, and support in schools. The support for young people, like I said, this is based on need, not diagnosis in City and Hackney, which includes the support in schools, graduated response with regards to team around the schools, awareness session like everyone has talked about for school staffs and parents, mental health services, that is a referral to what we call CAMS, which is the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services. And when we are talking about a single point of access, it's like a one hub, which is triage for, to, for identified mental health need without need for diagnosis. And then the occupational ther um, therapy is support with functional difficulties, including sensory coordination and learning difficulties and developmental delays. This slide is a link, and I think you could comfortably share that. So I will move on to the fifth slide. Thank you. Yeah. So in terms of the pathway to assessment, the health visitor can be a source of advice. This has been put in two sections for under fives and also five and 18 years old. This can be a source of advice for the under fives. The pathway to assessment is slightly different for young people who are under the age of five and those between five and 18 years old. Under five pathway, Information is drawn from people who know the child across education and health in order to inform the diagnosis. We have a joint play-based assessment that takes place with a pediatrician and a clinical psychologist 
speech and language therapists or occupational therapists. And let me clearly cite my own personal experience with regards to this. I had my last babies 18 years ago, they're twin boys. And because they were born premature, one of the boys seems to have, when he was younger, was concerned that um, in, with regards to his speech and I was referred to the speech therapist and where we had to go, uh, we had to go for a very um, series of um, assessment. And eventually it was observed that there wasn't any cause for concern. And it was, we were actually told that by the time he goes to school, by the time he finishes his primary school, mixing with friends, attending schools, everything will change. And clearly it did change. There, there wasn't anything that was offered other than him participating in everything with schools. So but it was good that we had that assessment at the beginning. So once a decision is being taken, it's made families are invited for a feedback session, like in my own case. After the assessment, I was invited for the feedback session and it was explained. And like I said, the support and information were the next term step for us. And often other colleagues from education or health who are working with family will also attend this appointment in order to create a comprehensive plan of support. For over five pathway, in City and Hackney, any professional working within a young person or a family, like a school staff, GP family worker, and they have concerns about possible autism, can refer to CAMS, like I said previously, for an assessment. And you send the referral to the single point of access. And when young people are referred, a psychologist will get in contact with the family to explain the pathway and gather more information about their needs, which might include mental health support, parent support, depending on the assessment of needs. A questionnaire will be sent to the family and the school to gather key information pre-assessment. If the information gathered indicates possibly ASD, the young person will be put on waiting list. But unfortunately, we have between 12 and 18 months for the waiting list. And why is that? I think sincerely it's um, resources. <laughs> the assessment consists of two parts, a developmental interview with the parents and carer and a standardized semi-structured assessment with the young person. And sometimes school observation would be needed as well. But in most cases, it all depends. And after the assessment, a report will be shared with the family and young person explaining the outcome of the assessment and including a set of recommendation. If the diagnosis is positive, parents will be invited to attend the parent information section. And if more support is needed, the young person or parents or carer can be referred for further help based on their needs. And I think this is um, my last slides. And this is just basically talking about what we offer in terms of intervention for young people and also comorbid mental health problems like depression and anxiety and the evidence-based parent group um, that we offer. And the last slides are the links to our resources, which is the Hackney Local Offer, National Autistic Society and Autist, Autism Education Support. But let me speak briefly. Um, can you, I don't mind you taking off this slide so that I can speak briefly on the report that was, thank you. Let me speak briefly on a report or a research that was done. And this is with regards to Let's Talk Pro report carried out with East London NHS Foundation Trust with um, Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic Group in Tower Hamlet, Newham and City and Hackney. And based on what um, Dr. Akwade and Dr. Nazila have said, um, there were concerns, no doubt about that. The teams across where they talked about the cultural awareness, empathy and compassion. And some of these, these are key issues. And um, in terms of lack of knowledge about different cultures, they talked about that, about that in terms of stereotype 
and reduce compassion and empathy, it was talked about. And in the course of carrying out this, um, this report, they had interviews with those with lived experiences, stakeholders, um, various residents, and some of their comments is, is on the outcome of the report. And, and it was also suggested that some do not see the representation of themselves in mental health services. So that's why there is need for training in cultural competence. And when we're talking about cultural competence, it could involve role-playing scenarios involving people from different cultures. They could use different training materials, like a role reversal video, where BAME people are the majority. Now we call it global black majority. And also lived experiences, like Dr. Akande have said, hearing firsthand accounts of people with lived experience. And there's something we also call, call unconscious bias training. And another key factor and a key observation that came out also is in terms of not having enough diversity in the workplace. The participants that took part wanted to see more BAME in terms of ethnic staff in services across the board. And this will help with regards to positive discrimination that may feel them very comfortable. And they felt that having staff from the same culture a background and themselves and this could also make communication easier. You know, however, it was not enough just to have staff from BAME background. They also needed to have the knowledge of offering culturally sensitive intervention and um, the professionalism and the understanding and compassionate. So thereby, it's not only about that, but also in terms of um, looking at the prof um, from a professional perspective. They also looked into accountability in terms of the complaint process, how, you know, um, it's just too formal and long, and that's something they really wanted to look into. And they, the, some of the solutions that they talked on was um, the provisional period, also to look at new staff and all that. And also they talked about regular service user feedback forum. But there is need for training and education because like the, the previous speakers have said, the need for training, the need for education with parents, with service users within the community. And we're, we, we're looking at the peer support group, groups, ensuring that there's adequate information with leaflets and also having that conversation with staff at first point of contact and also the need for advocacy, advocacy to be more accessible for service users and to be promoted. I think I'll just stop it here and I'm happy to take much questions. But for me as a politician and as a policymaker, I think this is a, no doubt about that. There are challenges when it comes to resources from the yeah. central government, like, like we all know, which is affecting us. And at the same time, we have to continue to look at various ways of intervention and in terms of collaboration with services to, um, in order to support our residents. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. As, um, as I've done earlier, I'll put you in the parking lot for now, while I will go to Madam Tracy, Miss Tracy de Groot, is a parent, a parent that is living the experience. You know, if you do all the talking without actually listening to who is living this life, we may not really understand. So she has been kind enough to join us and I uh, will yield the floor to her for now. And deliberately, I'm not reading out the bow of everybody. I will post that later. Please, you have the floor, Tracy. Hi, Lady Kay. <laughs> Thank you. And you're going to um, put up my port PowerPoint and uh, run that for me, right? I can't hear you. Sorry. Can you, can you increase the volume? Yeah. You can't yes. hear me? Okay, hold on, hold on. Yeah. 
Is that better? I'll speak louder. Is that better? Okay. <laughs> speak louder. Let's feel this one. <laughs> I'll put on my big voice. <laughs> okay. You've got the PowerPoint ready? Yeah. Please go ahead. Oh, okay. you want me to display your yeah. PowerPoint? <laughs> One moment. <laughs> just, just give me a moment. That's okay. Oh, well, yeah, the first, yeah, that's fine. I think I, I got carried away. Just, just a moment. Yeah, I'll be there. Uh, da, 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 da. So now I have to share your PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay, can you see? Yeah, so just the first thing. Let's okay. hold on a little bit. Let me make it bigger. Bingo. Yes, excellent. So good morning, um, everyone. Good evening to those in Nigeria or to- uh, uh, We need your voice to be- Oh, welcome. sorry. You still can't hear. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Is that better? It's a bit better. better. Okay. Good morning, everyone. And thank you to Global Women Ambassadors and 3C Autism Support for inviting me and presenting and um, being able to speak on behalf of a mother's perspective. So I am a single mother, and aside from being a, a nurturer, I'm a determined advocate for the wellness and health of uh, our, ch our children. Um, my son is 18 with a dual diagnosis of a developmental disability and autism. So the, the DD came at eight and the autism came at 11. Um, I have 18 years of lived experience of which the years through puberty between 14 and 16 were the most challenging. Uh, the challenges are where the educating and immersing myself truly began and where I could feel I could start to make a difference. Um, so we'll go next slide. Thank you. And uh, so a bit, uh, it, it lists her what, you know, what I am as far as a mother and an advocate and that I actually um, am very active in, the, in my community. Um, I sit on a family advisory committee with a local uh, agency. Uh, I also volunteer with Autism Ontario and an advisor to a special education advisory committee to the school boards. Um, so being involved um, makes a big difference um, because then my voice is heard and I can hopefully make change for myself and for others moving forward. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. So yeah, dealing with the diagnosis, the mother's perspective. Parents are often given reassurance that the concerns they have about their child uh, are unnecessary or unfounded that the child is going through a phase or is just a little delayed for their age. Trust your instincts. If after seeing your doctor and or assessment team, you still have concerns, ask to be referred elsewhere for another opinion. Remember, parents, family members, and other caregivers of children on the autism spectrum are usually first to notice delays in the child meeting the usual developmental milestones or differences in the ability to speak make eye contact with or play with other children or interact socially. So with that being said, um, our children that are not on the spectrum, we get to know them, their quirks, their likes, their dislikes. However, with our wonderful special needs children, I wanna strongly encourage parents out there to really get to know them. If they're nonverbal, this is even more paramount. You completely immerse yourself to fully understand their nonverbal cues. You are therefore better able to help your loved ones. So when I speak of nonverbal cues, um, even though um, my son is 18, I have 18 years of the lived experience, I'm still learning and I learn every day. And sometimes, you know, it takes months and months. So just, you know, he's 18, but just <laughs> maybe a year and a half ago, I realized that by him touching his head, you know, there's so many different sensory issues they have that I realized he was having a headache. So when I said to him, does your head hurt? He said, yes. So now I know that when I see that motion, it's because his head hurts. 
or if he incessantly is scratching somewhere over and over again, I see that he's developing a rash. Um, if he has certain body movements, um, that I know he's, he can direct himself to the bathroom, but he needs to go. So it's just learning the nonverbal cues. Um, and when you get to the place of knowing every sound, move, et cetera, uh, then you're able to anticipate your child's needs. It becomes a win-win. Your child is happy. You're happy because you're able to understand more. So immersing yourself is really important. Um, next slide, please. Um, being uh, an advocate. The importance of being an advocate for your child and yourself is results oriented and leads to successful outcome. As a caregiver, you become noticed and respected for your diligence to ensure the highest level of care and attention to your child, youth, or adult with special needs. So I put four notes here. Um, empower. When I say empower, uh, I want you to use your voice. I want you to speak up. You won't know until you ask. Embrace. Embrace relationships with people in the community. You're um, developing and nurturing friendly interactions, your teachers, your doctors, your therapists, caregivers, whoever in your circle. So um, you become, uh, it becomes a very easy relationship. Then they'll be able to service you better. Educate yourself. Attend as many seminars, groups, online or in-person uh, groups that you can have within your community. And delegate. This is really important because I think as a, as a mother and a caregiver for uh, children with special needs, yeah, we, we want to do it all. We, you know, we think that no one else knows best, but the, one of the best advice I was given was to reach out and get help because your child will always love you, but what they need to do is be able to trust someone else. So it's okay to say, no, I can't do it and I need help. Um, and on this note too, with advocacy is knowledge is power. The more informed you are, the better you are received, which will result in your voice being heard. Um, and unfortunately in our marginalized communities, um, it's unfortunate that we witness and experience this, uh, uh, witness and experience inferior or less attention to, the need, to their needs. Therefore, please advocate. And next slide, uh, here we are, you're on the right slide there, thank you. Self-care, self-care, the, the importance to reset and realign, um, I categorize as respite. You know, it's really hard to give self-care, um, but it's important if we take them as formal or informal respites, five minutes, 50 minutes a day, whether it's sitting down um, and having a cup of tea, whatever it is, or to meditate. Uh, or a long one, if you can, and get a night off yourself. Uh, receive, accept and offer assistance from family or friends, accepting and acknowledging help, promoting your own mental health and well-being. Um, Self-care is not easy. However, personal experience tells me that when I don't take even an informal respite, it greatly impacts my ability to cope as well. So in the end, uh, I say, be good to you. So to be good to your special loved ones. Um, the other information I have, Lady Kay, is um, agency information, but um, we can post that later on as far as resources within Ontario that I have, the different agencies that I've used um, that apply to from birth to 18 and 18 and older. Um, there is a lot of help out there and I, you, it doesn't just, you open a page, you Google something, it's there. It's really about making that relationship and communicating. So I do have those resources available to um, be posted later on. And the last slide is, thank you very much for the time and letting me contribute from a mother's perspective. Um, <laughs> and I hope that I can touch if not one person um, and be happy there to answer your more questions. Thank you. Oh my God, thank you so very much. This has been very impactful. And um, uh, Lady Pat, are you there? I acknowledge the presence of um, the community leaders. I cannot mention the names of everybody. 
So please uh, pardon me if I'm not mentioning your name. I see you, Chief Minister I see you. Uh, that is the president of the Yoruba Community Association in Toronto. How are you, ma'am? You can say hello, you can meet us out. I see uh, Margaret Ngosu, that is the vice president of the Nigerian Canadian Association in the greater Toronto area. I see uh, Alaji. Yes. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. Really nice program. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, unfortunately, we had a technical glitch, which is so. Uh, Lady Pat, are you there? Good afternoon, everyone. This is Margaret Mosu. Nice job, uh, Lady K. Thank, Thank you, so you for the invite. I really, uh, um, I got a lot of information. I really appreciate, you know, Thank today's you. section. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so this session now is for questions, answers, contributions. You want to add anything to what has been said? You have a question for any of the speakers or just any contribution in the next five minutes? We are landing up. If you have, you can jump in. Any contributions? Anike, Sister Anike, thank you so much for joining. Uh, Sister Kemi, I see you. So um, things are kind of different today because like I said, we have a technical glitch. People have been sending messages. They are not able to join. I don't know what happened. We were going to have a second part so for sure, we have to have the second part now because majority of the people have been excluded from this discussion. So hopefully next month, we have a part two. Okay. Before you go, Lady K. Yes. I Can would like to acknowledge that this uh, topic that you brought about yeah. is a very good topic. People are shy away from it. They don't want to accept it. Even to go for diagnosis, mothers will say, no, this is not in my family. I am so much overwhelmed for seeing all this. And I shared it to all those people like cool that, oh, listen to it because it's a good uh, topic for the awareness of uh, autism. And even some uh, children, they are not uh, non-verbal. Their parents will still say, no, no, we don't want to diagnose or we don't want any assessment. So I use this medium to tell everyone here that as much as possible, try to champion and uh, let people be aware that it is real. I work with the, um, the children, autism children in school, and we can see how these children, when they are gotten very early, they excel. Like uh, Mrs. Akonde said, I was so overwhelmed to hear her about the PhD son of his is so much overwhelming. So thank you, Lady K, for this uh, awareness. And we'll be looking forward to another uh, chapter session that you'll be sharing. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so very much, uh, Madam Kemi. Thank you so much. Shadi I see your hand is up. Or meet yourself. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add just a bit I mean, on stigma, because there is no doubt when we are looking at all this within our community, stigma plays a very, very highly, um, is, is in, is placed in a very high place. And I think we really need to increase in terms of the awareness of mental health across the community. Because I, I went to Nigeria, I just came back, I came back from Nigeria two weeks ago. And when we were having the Mental Health Awareness Week, in which the theme for this year was anxiety, and I was in Nigeria, and I told myself, I can't stop, but I have to, I must raise the level of awareness. And believe you me, I was quite impressed with the conversation that we had on simple things um, with regards to people not knowing and, th and um, thinking it's something else, not knowing it's just anxiety. So I think there is need for increased awareness of mental health across yeah. the community in order to address. So I think we need to in order to address the misconception around mental health. So the more we talk about it, the more we co-produce co materials, the more like like Dr. Akode, the more we bring out the lived experience. Look, I mean, people we, we have great personalities with autism, examples are all over. 
And no doubt about that, we need to bring this out and for people to know that autism is not a disease. It is, I mean, it, there, there are strengths and weaknesses in everything. We need to bring out the strength at all time. And we must continually talk to our families and friends, like they've said. So I just wanted to chip that in that stigma and, and also the culture are two key things that cultural awareness that we really need to still talk deeper on when we are looking at this. Thanks. Thank you so very much. Uh, at this moment, please turn on your cameras. We are going to be taking pictures. As we are taking pictures, uh, see Madam Anike Onile, your hand is up. Please, you have the floor for your contributions. Anike Onile, unmute yourself, please. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Lady K, uh, I just want to applaud you for this program. Uh, it's very educational and uh, not only educational, but it also actually bringing us an awareness with the area that we lacked in the society and stuff um, in this system, this particular system. Um, first, I have about two questions or two inputs. One from the Canada side, uh, um, I actually forget her name from the social support uh, for disability services for the report that she did. Um, yes, exactly. Okay. I just want to, uh, because that's one of the major issue that we have here in Canada for parents coming out um, to participate in the in the study because how can government help the black community if we are not participating in a research if we are not um kind of uh, letting them know about um you know the kind of needs that we need uh the kind uh, you know, the, so we can get the resources all we do is complain and complain, but when it comes to um, actually participating in, in uh, 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 raising our own voice and letting them know about what we need, because the, the, the government make an arrangement for grant to help our community, but we don't speak out. It, uh, like she, she mentioned about how it is so hard for her to actually get about seven uh, black people to participate in that research. And that can actually, that can um, in turn help our community. If we see a lot of people, and I know there's a lot of uh, Nigerians that uh, maybe, um, you know, they have children with this kind of disability and that can participate. So it's how do we put it out there to get a lot of black people involved in this? So we'll be able to tap in into the resources available for us. So that is that is one session, and the second session is going to Nigeria. Um, I remember, like uh, before the COVID twenty nineteen, I wanted to I, I started uh, putting in um, um, what do you call it, a building for uh, homeless in uh, in at Akure there, and, and then there is not no help. I, I'm not um, asking for help from the government, but uh, I'm shocked that even the majority of things like an assessment from the government, from the state um, children development at Akure, we have to pay for them also, even including taking pictures to do an assessment. And uh, that is very wrong in Nigeria. I can see that uh, uh, um, uh, I will uh, I will also uh, thank uh, Mrs. Sakonde because for, um, you know, for the work that you are doing, you are doing a great job, ma. Thank you so much for what you are doing to, uh, in Nigeria right there. But we need more government involvement. Only person or one person cannot just do this. Uh, you have the resources, you have the fund. That's why you are able to hire um, a speech therapy or educational to help your, your, your son. But there are people that are living in poverty that they can't even afford to put something in their mouth. So if they can't eat, how can they pay a speech therapy? That's where the government comes in. How do we get government involved in Nigeria to, to take care of these uh, young people that uh, they have so much potential, but uh, because of a uh, government uh, 
uh, uh, uh, non-involvement, and, uh, and in this case, end up somewhere, which if, if they get involved, they can have a future. So it's how do we get them involved? How do we work together to do this? So I, I, I mean, like, I think somebody is calling me, sorry, I, I, it's affecting, so I cut it off. Um, Lady K is doing a lot of work right now. How do you collaborate with those one in Nigeria to bring this voice out? They need to be aware of it. Thank you. Uh, so I thank you for this program and I thank you for all involved and uh, Mrs. Uh, Etty and uh, those one from the other uh, uh, part of the world uh, for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We are rounding up now. Just want to uh, uh, ask if there's any other person that has anything to say. Just one minute each. Any other person? Uh, well, I have some. I have something to say. Okay, one second. I like your last one. Thank you so much. Thank you. I can see you. <laughs> Okay. Um, let yeah, you you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, where thank are you me. joining us from? I think you are from. I think I joined you about ten minutes into the program or something. Like where? That. Where? Where are you? Now? I, I'm in England. I'm in okay. England. Right. Thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you. you so much. You're yeah. Welcome. Okay. Uh, let it pass. One minute. Okay. Uh, we thank all all the speakers. You know that have given us very insightful information concerning this very issue on ground. It's been a worrisome one for families and the caregivers. Uh, one thing I want to say is that, like we said, it's not an individual thing. It's, nobody can actually individually cater for the for these uh, issues we are having. I want to encourage each and every one of us, in as much as we look onto the government to give this support to those uh, organizations rendering this uh, humanity service, we as individuals on our own part should also reach out to these organizations. Our little, you know, the, the, no matter how little we can contribute to these organizations, we go far to help them render this and provide the services. So these are lovely children that are, you know, being faced with this kind of challenge. So okay. from our own little quarter, we should reach out to these organizations and okay. render support to them. Thank okay. you. That's a very valid point. Like St. Patrick, I think she will need to share her information again. They are doing a very wonderful job. Um, we need to send her two cents to them. $100 is a lot of money when it gets to Nigeria. It will do, it will do a long way. Uh, I did talk to I see your hand up. One minute. We are landing up. One minute. Olushola, I did to meet yourself. Thank you very much. Um... I just want to- Where, where are you joining us from? Um, presently, I'm in the UK. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I just want to add, like one or two people have said, um, that um, we need a lot of more awareness, particularly in Nigeria. I presently work with um, special needs um, children mm -hmm. here in the UK. So, and it's something I'm working on. So, I mean, this program for me is like um, added value. And um, like somebody said again, I want to appeal to Lady K um, for maybe future programs like this. I believe um, there could be opportunities of getting one or two people involved in the educational system. I know that um, the present um, leadership, particularly in Lagos State, I mean, she's an educationist, so I'm sure even if she can't be on this platform she could get somebody on this platform that can give an insight into one or two things that is happening probably in Lagos state or you know can get ideas you know from what is being shared i'm particularly happy to have met um, mrs um, akondi on this platform really and truly i did not know something like that was happening in nigeria mm. and really for me it's it's mind-blowing because um, it's, 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 um, I've, I've taken her details really, because I'll be following up with her. Because like I said, this is something I'm looking at and um, it's happening around us, particularly in our communities. And particularly, let me use, I mean, you know, we, we a lot of us, we either go to church or mosque in our 
religious settings. Mm. We need to bring this home. We need to bring this home. So I, I want to say thank you. And um, I've gained so much. And I have a lot of tools to work with. Thank you really so have... very much. Thank you. Uh, Kati Salami, one minute. Um, I, I wanted to find out. Where, where are you joining California. us from? I'm from US, California, US. Thank you. I wanted to find out, are there resources after the age of 18? Do we really have any available resources after the age of 18? And then my comment with, um, I don't know much, I don't know you guys. So my comment with what the lady that was talking about, she went to a place in Lagos and there was nothing. I'm a psychotherapist. And I have volunteered a few times in some major hospitals. They don't have nothing. Hmm. The hospitals does not encourage anything. You don't have protection. Um, I went to one in Benin. I have to get my own DSM-5. I have to get my own pen. They will not provide nothing. So it's so strenuous. Many of us really want to help, but they don't even appreciate the help. I don't think they understand the importance. And I really strongly believe that there's going to, if we can, let us do more awareness within the government and then within the parents. Thank you. Thank you so very much. We want to appreciate everybody. Uh, Tracy, you want to answer her question? Yeah, as far as, so, but she's, the, she's in California. So here in Ontario, and there is definitely uh, uh, support and services for over 18. So as far as, in California, it is, I can't even give a comparison because it's, it's not even Canada. Here in Ontario, it's called Development Service Ontario. It is through the government and the funding actually is great over 18 because they have to realize they have to now take an account that our special children are now becoming adults. They need to be able to give compensation for housing expenses, even though your child may live with you. So it becomes greater. So I'd say she has to reach out to her local um, community and government um, government sector to help that way because here, yes, it, there is help in great team. Okay, thank you thank so you. very much. Um, Dr. Nazila, you have a last word, one minute. We're rounding up now and uh, for your information again, we have so many people getting pissed off with us right now that they cannot join. So we have no option. We are doing another follow-up by next month. And uh, for the person that joined from US, we are going to have someone from US then that will be able to give you the information you seek. Madam Tina, you are you just joined now. Hello to you from uh, London, England, I believe. She has from been- From Ireland, from Dublin, Ireland. I tried to join earlier and I couldn't. Yes. And I'm gutted that I missed most of it. And yeah. a few other friends as well tried to join. So please uh, do, uh, share the next uh, uh, event details so that we can join as well. Yeah, uh, everyone, everyone that um, that registered, we are going to send the video today, okay. and okay. then we will do the follow up. Okay. So sorry you, about Reverend. that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, Dr. Nazila. Um, th thank you so much. Um, I feel like this really has been a global women's get together, and I appreciate also the uh, men who have joined, um, learning that we have colleagues from Nigeria, uh, from the UK, Ireland, USA, uh, etc. So I feel like when we come together um, in events like this, it takes a lot of work. So thank you so much, Lady Kay, and again to Mr. Michael for the connection. Uh, I feel like uh, in our uh, individual uh, personal experiences, the similarities are very many, uh, but you know, the types of services and uh, help that's available then really depend on where we're at. And I think this is a community that, that should collectively come together and advocate for all, not just in the neighborhoods that we live in, in the provinces, countries we live in, but take a bit more international global perspective in saying how can we advocate for persons with disabilities uh, because persons with disabilities uh, and their families they have a human rights to health 
they have their human rights to mental health and to services that will help them thrive uh, in society. So thank you very much again for having me part of today. I've learned a lot and I'm uh, very grateful for that. And I wish, um, I wish everyone um, a, a great Saturday after, well, for, for afternoon here in Toronto. So I wish everyone a good evening or afternoon <laughs> or morning, wherever you are. Thank, thank you. you thank you so very much uh, for your busy schedule doing this um, is your passion so i appreciate you being here and uh who is am i yet to call i'm yet to call um madam doctor is deliberate uh shady honorable are you there yes no. i'm here okay I'm here. your last um, one minute thank you my last one minute i'd like to say a big thank you for to global ambassadors for organizing the event and also to dr nazila and dr akode and with what everyone have said in terms of um, intervention and taking things further with regards to government perspective that is where we come in as policy makers and i'll sincerely continue to work with lady k on this and see how we can best and maximize and make things work with regards to government and also in terms of Nigeria um, where I am from. I think everyone has said it, lots of awareness, we really have to bring it out and like Dr. Akonde's um, son that is currently doing his PhD, it's a great, great effort. We really have to commend that. We have to bring these lived experiences out for people to see and for them to know. And mental health, we all know after the pandemic, it's, it's something that affects one in four and it will continue to. And by 2050, we, we are beginning to see the report and research in terms of dementia. So there's a lot to talk about when we're talking about mental health. So clearly from, from me, from perspective, and as a policymaker and a politician, I would definitely be willing to work in accordance with various charities so that we can take this forward. Thank you very much for, for doing this. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. So now I go to Mrs. Akonde. It's deliberate because I want you to give your contact again. And uh, okay, I had difficulty joining too. That is uh, Stella Hill. Oh, all the way from God. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Every one of you, I acknowledge you. If I don't mention your name, please don't be angry with me today. Uh, just know I love you. Thank you for joining. Thank you for supporting. And uh, Mrs. Akode, please give your contact, let people know how they can reach you. And I want to appeal to everyone, someone doing a job like this needs our support, especially in Nigeria. Nigeria, you know how it is that we say in our local palace, if you know, do you know it? So it, for her to have to struggle a lot to care for these kids, whatever you have, Nothing is small. I have an organization I donate to every month. It's not much, but I know on top of my head, I know that at least this will take care of maybe one person. So please talk to us. Okay, thank you very much, Lady K, for this. And thank you everybody that joined and for sharing your experiences and being vulnerable. Um, stigma is still very much of a concern to us in Nigeria and we keep talking about it. That is why every time I come and I have the opportunity, I let them know that my son may not be where we would like him to be, but he's doing great and living a full and functional life because we did not give up, not, and, and not only because we had the resources, it's because we just did not give up. Exactly. We tried everything under the umbrella, under the face of the earth to get him to get to where he is today. And not all children will get to that level, but what we want is all children to live a full and functional life. Wherever they can um, excel, we must continue to come in from a place of strength. And um, thank you again, everyone, for, for coming. And thank you, um, Shade Eti, uh, for sharing my non-doctoral um, <laughs> notion. I'm not a doctor. I'm a missus. I'm just a mother of a, of a young man and a mother of many, many, many children here in Nigeria. And you can reach us on, I, I try to type on the chat box, but it's only going directly to Lady K. If yeah. you visit our website, which is pslcautism-ng.org, everything about us is there. Our email address, our social media, 
our phone numbers, everything, all the work we've been doing in the past, in the past couple of years, you can see view on our website. We are open to collaboration for others to come in and then give an insight into how we can make it better. Like I, uh, Nigeria is very peculiar. Nobody comes to see us at our center to find out what we do in the part of, in the, uh, uh, from the side of the government. We are not regulated. So we've had to go abroad to get ourselves regulated. So that is how much work we have to do you know, thank you. to get this, this done. So thank you again, everyone. God bless you. Thank and you. Have a you can time. see, you can see my screen. Uh, we'll be having a thank you so much for recognizing Global Women Ambassadors. Actually, this program has been put together by two organizations, Global Women Ambassadors and 3C Autism and Mental <laughs> Support Services in Canada. 3C, that is the name. Very soon you are going to be hearing that name all over. There are a support agency that are just studying, but they are studying on a big scale. It's not your usual thing you are going to be seeing with them. I'm happy, Global Women Ambassadors is happy to work with this organization. So thank you so very much, 3C Autism. And um, before we leave, we need to appreciate the people that have been behind this program today. Uh, we have volunteers that have been working with us. Tina, thank you so much. I see you smiling behind the camera. Thank you. So we have uh, our volunteers, the main volunteer we have for this program. Please let us clap for her, Patricia. That is her that you are seeing. You can meet yourself at this stage. Now you can meet yourself. You want to say a word to everybody just to thank them? Yeah, I want to sincerely on behalf of Global Women Ambassadors to say thank you to each and every one of you that has joined us online for this event. We are so grateful. We are not taking it lightly. We appreciate your contributions. We appreciate all our speakers for sharing your insightful you know, knowledge with us. We, we are not taking it for granted. We thank you for your time and everything. And for as many that couldn't join, we say we are very, very sorry. <laughs> it's a situation we had no control, even though we tried as much as we could to address the situation. We look forward to seeing all of you again next time when we call on you to be part of us. Thank you so much. I really appreciate. Uh, Dr. Akonde, I say thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you all the way, thank you. Every one of you, those from the Aspera, we say thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Keep thank up the you. good work, thank you. Thank you everybody. Please unmute yourself and say bye-bye to everybody. We are the stage, we are saying bye-bye. Bye. And bye. thank you, thank you thank to you. all our speakers. Bye. Thank you all attendees. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Next bye. Month. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. And if you want to participate bye. next month, bye. you can send me a personal bye. message. Bye. Thank bye. you, bye. thank bye. you, bye. thank you for the love from all I wish you. Thank you so much. Bye. Baba to the Fakule, thank you. Thank you, Lady K. I appreciate it. Thank you. God bless you. Stella Hill, you are just wonderful all the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Ali Kwek, thank you. Bye for now. Bye. God bless.